Hi, everyone. I'm attorney Donna DiMaggio Berger, and this is Take It to the Board, where we speak condo and HOA. People living in community associations are highly regulated by state and federal laws. This is one reason why people living in these communities need to pay close attention to the legislation that passes each year, which impacts them. Getting to know your legislator and becoming a resource for him or her on community association issues is equally important. I'm delighted to have State Representative Dan Daly with us today. Representative Daly is the Florida House of Representatives member from District 97, which is comprised of portions of Coral Springs, Sunrise, Plantation, and Tamarack. As a matter of fact, I happen to be one of his constituents as a resident of Plantation. Representative Dan Daly is the Democratic Ranking Member of the State Legislature, Redistricting Subcommittee, and also serves on the Commerce Committee, Environment, Agriculture, and Flooding Subcommittee, Infrastructure and Tourism Appropriations Subcommittee, and the Local Administration and Veterans Affairs Subcommittee. Dan, welcome to Take It to the Board. Thanks, Donna. Thanks so much for for having me. It's great to be with you. So, Dan, I have to say at the outset that we met way back when you were a legislative aide to Representative Ari Porth. I was lobbying up in Tallahassee at that time on community association issues. We're looking at each other during this podcast taping, although our listeners are only going to hear us. You haven't changed at all. And I want to know, way back when, did you know at that point that you were going to run for public office someday? Well, thanks so much again, Donna, for having me. And, and uh, I know you said I haven't changed a bit, but you actually have it. My, my hair's a little grayer and the, the hairline has receded. So uh, it's good to be with you nonetheless. And uh, all these years later, I think at some point I, I wanted to have a, a career in the public space. I'm in the public sector, but it was supposed to be after a lengthy military career. But when I was a student at Florida State, which is when we first met, I met Ari Porth, who was the then state representative from that area. And he gave a first generation college kid a chance to be a legislative aide. And so at the ripe old age of 18, I was running our Tallahassee office and working on statewide policy. And I kind of caught the bug and stuck with it. And so, you know, came home and uh, ran for local office to the Coral Springs City Commission for seven years. And now I've been in the state legislature for three in actually the seat that Representative Porth uh, used to hold. So it's uh, very meaningful to me as well. What a great mentor to have as an 18-year-old college student in Ari. You guys always made it look like you were having fun up there. We did. We worked hard, but we also had a lot of fun, but always tried to. And I think you know this. Ari is the, probably one of the nicest people on the planet and with one of the most genuine hearts of anybody you'll ever meet. And so I've tried to kind of emulate a lot of that and trying to just do what's right, not necessarily what's popular, but what's right for the most, you know, in this case, uh, Floridians. So your district is comprised of cities that have large numbers of community associations, including the Homeowners Association where I live, Dan. So do you know approximately how many community associations are in your district, whether there's, you know, a lot of HOAs or condos or a mixture? Sure. Yeah, there's a ton. Both. There's a good mixture of both. And and particularly in places like Tamarack, Plantation, the condo numbers are probably a little bit higher, but HOA is all through Coral Springs and the rest of the district as well. So there's a number of them, and, and I hear from a lot of them regularly. You have a number of 55 and over communities, senior housing communities. I imagine they contact you fairly frequently. That's right. Yeah, Kings Point in my district being the being the largest, we're there pretty frequently. I'd say uh, once every other week or so for events or meetings and have folks reach out all the time and obviously try to maintain good relationships with the board and, and everybody out there. It's try to be, honestly, to try and be helpful uh, however we can. I said in the intro, Dan, that it's important to get to know your legislator, right? You know, it's important to know the laws that are being passed. They're going to impact the people living in these communities. But it's equally important for your legislators to know who you are. How do these folks reach out to you? Is it typically phone calls, pop-ins in your, your district office, you know, emails? What's the preferred method that you find that people reach out to you? So it, it really varies, but I'm one of the few that puts my cell phone number out everywhere. I mean, it goes out to, if we send a mailer to the community, if it's on that mailer, it's on, it's all over social media, it's all over the internet. I've been doing that for, I mean, over, this this November will be 10 years as an elected official. And I started that when I was first elected. And so, because I believe that, you know, everybody in my district should be able to reach me directly, not just my office. So uh, sometimes it's over the phone, sometimes it's a text message, sometimes, a lot of the times it's an email. Sometimes with the more tech savvy folks, it, it's a message on social media right? So I try to be as open as I can in all different aspects because I want to be as approachable and reachable as possible. 
You know, I follow you on social media, and I think you have a great social media presence. You've really given people a glimpse into who you are as a person. You're not just this nameless, faceless legislator for your district. I mean, I know that you ride horses. We have that in common. And I think that's great. How important do you think that is today for legislators to kind of give that glimpse into who they are as people and what they value? Yeah, look, I think it's I think it's very important, right? I think it also helps us get back to a more collegial, more moderate conversation, right? Right now, everybody's kind of at the polls and everybody's, uh, whether you're on the far left or the far right, and everything is very toxic, you know, when we have political conversations. And I think it's, it's really hard, Donna, to to attack somebody, especially baselessly, when you, when you know them and you know them and you know their family and you knew that they grew up in your community or you know, I went to school with your 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 children, right? It's it's much harder. And I would say the political discourse, even on a national stage, needs to get a little bit more like that. It needs to get a little bit more uh, where you know your colleagues and you know your the people you're working with, so you're less likely to to attack them, right? So you can have that compromise conversation to move the state forward, to move the nation forward, whatever the case may be. So I do think it's important. And I think it plays into it to your original point. I agree. I imagine we were talking about communication. I imagine that your phone is ringing off the hook about property insurance. I mean, Dan, I've had most of my clients who I represent condominiums, cooperatives, and homeowners associations, they saw huge increases in their premiums this last cycle. I think 50% was the minimum increase all the way upwards of 90%. What is the state doing about this crisis? I mean, some of these communities only had days to buy new coverage and they were scrambling to find the money to pay increases that high. Yeah, you know, I, I would tell you it is probably the number one issue that my office has been uh, hearing about and that I've been hearing about in the community. And we do need to do something. And, and candidly, we need to do something more uh, than what we did during a special session, right? This legislature, and, and not to, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to get partisan, I'm not trying to get overtly political, but there is one party that's in power in Tallahassee, and they have been for 25 years. We're a part-time legislature, and that means that we are only in legislative session for 60 days. We're only permitted to be in legislative session for 60 days. Those are the 60 days where you can pass bills, where you you know pass the budget, where you can actually make legislative changes. If you don't do your job in those 60 days, then the legislature has to come back or, you know, in, in extreme cases, maybe there's an emergency or something that, that we didn't have on the horizon, something like that. I understand in those one-off instances, but we've known property insurance was an issue for years, right? And we didn't handle it at all. We didn't address it at all during our actual legislative session. So what happens when you have 60 days to actually sit there, look at a policy proposal, amend a policy proposal, have professionals and experts like you and and others across the state weigh in, right? You have a whole 60 days to do that. When you do this quick fire special session, you know, hey, we're going to be in Tallahassee for three days. So you basically have 72 hours to pass actual legislation, which by the way, a special session costs taxpayers $72,000 a day. It costs you $72,000 a day to send us all to Tallahassee to do something that we should have done during our regular session. But you know, that's, that's a whole different story we can get into another time. But to your original point, you know, I just don't think that legislating by fire in a 72 hour time span, especially for something as important as property insurance is adequate. I I voted um, after the fact, I voted no on the bill that was passed in Tallahassee because I had a lot of concerns with it not going far enough, with it not actually addressing a lot of the issues in the property insurance market in, in hopes that we're going to take, and I do believe we will take, a more comprehensive look at the issue of property insurance this upcoming legislative session. But in the meantime, we've left Floridians kind of out there. And I'm sure you've heard it. I mean, you've heard it from your clients and your associations. I hear it from from residents in my community who are seeing, I mean, you're talking several thousand dollar increases overnight in their plan or their policy being dropped altogether or you them having to go to citizens, right? As well, a, well, for associations, you're talking yeah. a couple hundred thousand dollars. Sure, so one of sure. my clients went from $350,000 premium to 1.2 million. And yeah. here's the thing, what we're hearing, Dan, is a lot of people are considering not just self-insuring. It's one thing yep. if you live in a single family home and you want to take that risk, assuming you don't have a mortgage, but for associations, they can't take that risk. They are required by law to have adequate property and liability and coverage. And, you know, and they're making these decisions decisions on behalf of other on behalf of all their members. So when I hear an association say we just can't afford this, that is a real problem because you, sure. you have to have that coverage. If 
I'm hearing you correctly, though, what amount of time? I know there's a lot of states that have full time legislatures year round. What mm-hmm. amount of time do you think is really needed to tackle these kind of problems in a state as populous as Florida? You know, look, Donna, we're, we're now what the third largest state in the country. New York, who's the, I think New York is first or California's first. They both have, they both have a first or second. They both have full-time legislatures. And and look, I'm not saying, I'm not even suggesting that we may need a full-time legislature. I think we may need to eventually go in that direction. You certainly don't do this job for the money, but as a part-time, quote, part-time position, your state representative and your state senator make $30,000 a year to focus on this for, quote, 60 days of the year. Well, I can tell you, Donna, I added up all the days that we were in Tallahassee last year and it amounts to six months. So that's six months. And, and granted, that's what you sign up for, right? You sign up to serve and you sign up to do, you know, do the work and do the job. But what that has done is I'm fortunate, right? I'm an attorney. I work at a company who gives me the time that I need to go to Tallahassee and do that work. But there are so many Floridians who can't do that. So what you have by and large in Tallahassee is still kind of a excuse the expression, a good old boys club, right? You're either independently wealthy or you're an attorney at a law firm who understands why you need to be there and how it's valuable to them. Or you have a small you know, family business or medium-sized family business that the family picks up the slack while you're gone. But everyday average Floridians, they can't serve in our legislature, right? I don't think that our, our legislature by and large is really representative of Floridians. There's one firefighter in the entire Florida House and Senate. There's I don't think there's any current teachers. I don't think there's any current nurses. I think there may be a doctor or two, right? But you're not talking about everyday Floridians. You're talking about those that were able to either be in a good job that can send them up there or they're independently wealthy. So are those folks really looking out with, looking out for, and do they understand and commiserate with the everyday Floridian? I don't think that they do. And so I, I think I do, and maybe a couple of my colleagues, but by and large, you're talking about 120 people in the House and 40 people in the Senate. Yeah. And I wonder how many people realize when we talk about a representative body that just what you said, it's often not representative at all, but 30,000 is the current salary for a Florida state senator. I remember years ago, though, that the races to get elected, what was the the most expensive race recently to, to become elected to the Florida Senate? Oh, now it now it now it goes into the millions. I mean, it's 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 several millions of dollars that folks are, are raising or self funding if they've got their own money um, to get into the Florida Senate to get into the Florida House. Yeah, it's the the numbers balloon. We're we're a big state, right? We're we're a big and and candidly powerful state, and we're still operating with this part time citizen legislature that just I think sometimes can't keep up. And this this last minute doing massive policy in 72 hours, and it's not just property insurance. There's there's a number of other issues we've gone to Tallahassee on, whether it's redistricting, you know, the, the redrawing of all the lines for your state representative, your state senator, and your member of Congress, right? These are big issues. This is a big deal. It's something we do every decade, and the legislature did it in two days in Tallahassee. That's it's it's not it's not so the worries, and yeah, and it, and when you're when you're operating behind the eight ball. To get something done, it's a rush, rush procedure right. with often unacceptable results. You know, when I lobbied, Dan, I used to feel as if anything associated with condos or HOAs was seen by a lot of legislators as a headache, right? Oh, it's a condo bill. Oh, it's right. well, my right. phones are going to be ringing off the hook by, you know, right. condo commandos and people yeah. unhappy in the community. And what we saw and we continue to see today is these large omnibus bills where we might start out with numerous bills that deal with associations, but they kind of all get lumped into this huge, you know, 100 plus page, 150 plus page omnibus bill. And when you go through it, Dan, you know, you don't know whether or not to support it or kill it because there's, right. you know, maybe some great stuff in there and some awful stuff in there. Why do legislators do this when it comes to association legislation? Can't we just have standalone bills? This is the bill on reserve funding. This is the bill on construction. This is, you know, yeah. this is the bill on governance and rather than lumping it all together. Yeah. So look, it's it's a really good point. And, and just so you know, it's it's we don't only do it with condo and HOA bills, right? Oh, we okay. With, I feel better with then. All sorts. Yeah. No, we do it with all sorts of things. And 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 I candidly don't think we should, right? I think a standalone bill let that policy proposal stand on its own, right? And if it has merit and everybody agrees or or, or can agree on an amendment to move it forward, then that's fine. But these large, to your point, these large omnibus bills, really, I mean, the the majority in Tallahassee has gotten really good at inserting in one of those omnibus bills, a poison pill or two, where you really have no choice. So maybe there's, let's say there's 10 provisions in the bill, eight of them are really, really good, and they're good for Florida and everybody's supportive of them, but there's two that are just absolutely terrible 
right, that really shouldn't be contained in the bill at all. Well, they end up getting included anyway as the kind of poison pill. And so some people will break away and they'll vote no because ultimately they just can't stomach those two provisions, whatever they may be. But ultimately, the majority will still pass that bill and tout how great the policy is and how awesome it is. When in reality, those two policy proposals, that's just something that, let's say, the Speaker of the House or the Senate President wanted or it was a favor for somebody or if it was priority of the governor, right? I mean, that's the kind of stuff that goes on when you peel back the curtain a little bit. That's what generally gets inserted into those larger omnibus bills. And honestly, it just makes it worse policy. And in the case of a condo bill or an HOA bill, it it makes it worse policy for the state of Florida. Well, towards that end, let's talk about the condo safety bill, SB4D, that passed Mm -hmm. in special session. That was the result of the horrific Champlain Towers tragedy. Mm -hmm. I've had several guests on the podcast discussing how coastal multifamily living is going to be impacted by that new law. That new law requires periodic engineering. It requires reserve funding, both of which are really needed. I mean, once upon a time in Florida, living in a condo was your most cost-effective housing option, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you want a slice of paradise? Get a condo. But as these buildings have aged, I don't think people have understood that living in older buildings requires an extraordinary amount of of maintenance. And that means reserve funding and staying on top of everything. So how do we educate Floridians about the challenges and obligations associated with maintaining older buildings? You know, it's one thing to pass a law. How do we actually get it out there to them? And then what do you tell your constituents, Dan, because mm-hmm. I'm getting these phone calls too from boards saying, oh my gosh, you know, we're going to have to raise the assessments and there are people that can't afford it. I will tell you that I'm telling them this may be the time for those people to sell and move to other housing right. choices. Not maintaining, yeah. not reserving is not going to be an option, but how are That's you right. handling that? Yeah, you know, look, in a difficult situation. And, and to your point, right, this was another thing. There was a bill filed during legislative session. As a matter of fact, it was filed by an incoming speaker. So generally when an incoming speaker, you know, a couple of years removed, files a bill, darn thing moves, right? And for whatever reason, there was a lack of agreement with us in the Senate, so we couldn't get it through. So to your point, we tacked it on during a special session. Again, another case where that was really important and a really big deal for Florida. And I think the legislature as a body failed to not do their job during regular special, you know, regular session. But the bill that passed during special session is a step in the right direction. But to your point, it is a difficult conversation that needs to be had. And you're having it with your boards and your clients. I'm having it with my constituents because you're right, right? I mean, you have a lot of people who are on a fixed income who, you know, in this era of need for affordable housing has skyrocketed as much as it has in Florida, in other states as well, but mainly in Florida it's a difficult time. And so folks may not be able to find another option either, right? So they're faced with either an increase in the assessment or being priced out of the market altogether. And they have to move either out of South Florida or out of the state. So to that end, it is is a difficult question. I think where I struggle, and I understand, and maybe in very specific circumstances, there is something the state can do in terms of grants or loans. I'm more interested in loans. Donna, I'm going to be candid. I'm going to be very honest. I've lived in a condo building before. I've lived in other condo buildings before. And it seemed like, and I guess I'm overgeneralizing, I'm not talking about the retiree, right, who's on that fixed income, but most of the people, the board and everybody had no problem voting for an increase in assessment when it meant something tangible, something aesthetic, something, oh, we need to redo the lobby, we need to redo the elevators, we need to redo the pool, it's got to look pretty, I want to live here, I want a putting green. We had no problem doing an assessment increase then, but now you're talking about the structural integrity of your building. You know what, Dan? Concrete restoration isn't sexy. It's exactly to your point. There will be some communities that focus is on aesthetics. I want to see it. I'm spending the money. I want to see the new furniture in the lobby. I want to see the landscaping out front. But the fire pump, the sprinklers, the, yep. you know, the, the concrete restoration, the roof, the electrical, these are things that you don't see. But right. this has to be a shift in perspective. That's it right. has to be safety over aesthetics every single time. That's right. So I want to follow up on what you said, though, Dan, so our listeners understand that the state of Florida almost did not pass any safety legislation in the aftermath of the Champlain Towers collapse. They closed out the regular legislative session without passing a safety bill. It was only after there was a considerable amount of outcry that they passed that in a special session. That's amazing to me that this almost didn't happen. Is that a reflection of, again, partisan politics or... 
it's partisan politics. It's where the pressure is applied. It's how it's applied. I mean, I'll give you another example, not to speak to the to the Champlain Towers incident, but you, if you look at it, it's, it's kind of about timing with the legislature, right? If there's a crisis or a tragedy, either right, right before, during, or hopefully not after the legislature is in session, suddenly it sucks all the air out of the room and we have to address it because everybody's watching. It's got national attention. It's got a lot of pressure from other parts of the state or all parts of the state, right? And I'll give you two examples here in a second. But if it's something that happens outside of regular session and there's enough time between that and the next special session, it's a shame, but nothing happens. And I'll give you a perfect example. And it's one that hits particularly home for me. I think you know that I'm a graduate of Stoneman Douglas High School. I was on the city commission the day of the shooting. I was there within about 30 minutes of the shooting. It's a lot of what I work on in Tallahassee. I'll tell you, the legislature took actual action and passed the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Safety Act after that shooting. Part of why, and I'm just being blunt, part of why is because it happened in February when the legislature was in Tallahassee. They were wrapping up their legislative session and there was so much pressure on them to do something that they acted, right? Now, contrast that with the Pulse shooting, right? The Orlando nightclub shooting where 49 people were killed. It happened outside of legislative session. Not a single thing happened. Not a single piece of legislation was passed the following legislative session as it related to Pulse. Same thing with Hurricane Michael. Hurricane Michael ravaged the panhandle in northern Florida. It happened right before or right during, I think it was right before legislative session. And we put tons of funding and building code changes and all this other stuff through, right? So my question is, and it's an unfortunate question to ask, did the legislature fail to act because they thought the pressure had been relieved? So we have the attention span of what, a week now? Yeah, it's it's, unfortunately, it's a couple media cycles. I mean, it's really sad to say, but on certain issues, that's where I think we are. Now, in the case of Champlain Towers, I do think a little bit of it, just a little bit, was, hey, there is still some uncertainty in exactly how to address it, right? I mean, so they've taken a little bit of a step in the right direction. I still think there's more work to be done, but I think part of the legislature said, hey, let's just not do anything until we can get a full comprehensive response. But that's not a response either, right? You've got buildings all over this state that are aging day after day that are in danger if we're not taking concrete steps here. And what happened to the incremental approach to legislation? I mean, I always hearken back to the Florida Clean Indoor Air Act. Rather than trying to do everything at once, they took little tiny bites at the apple. And over years, Florida had one of the strongest clean indoor air acts in the country. I mean, that was my shock when I was looking at the safety proposals because my understanding, and again, I'm not inside the legislature, was that one legislator or maybe a handful wanted everything. And then mm-hmm. others said, no, that's too much. Well, pass something. You know, you got to start right. somewhere. So, but you know that's what? Right. The, the legislature did something good. They did pass a safety bill. They passed a bill that said, you know, depending on where you are, three miles from the the coastline, you have to have these engineering reports, inspections. You also need to have the structural integrity reserve studies. That's all great. But On the other hand, our Florida legislature continues year after year, and we saw it this last session after the Champlain Towers tragedy, a bill that would reduce the statute of repose, which limits the amount of time that people can bring a lawsuit against a developer for defective construction. And we see bills all the time that make it more difficult for associations to collect assessments. Well, assessments are needed to fund The reserves are needed to fund, to pay the engineers who are coming out to do these engineering studies. What's going on, Dan? Does the right hand not know what the left hand is doing? Do they not understand that you need to be able to go after developers who poorly construct these buildings? Safe buildings start with the people who build them. And do they not understand that associations can only pay for things if they can collect assessments? Yeah, you know, look, I I think it is a case where the legislature is not being intellectually consistent. And I think that sometimes that happens. And again, it's a shame, but sometimes that happens because you have one chamber focusing on one issue or being pulled in one direction, right? Where, you know, the solution to a partial solution to affordable housing is, you know, limiting liability and limiting the cost of litigation in the state. We are a a very litigious state. I want to say we're, we're second or third most litigious in the country. And so a lot of times, you know, certain members of the body get pulled in that direction and, okay, well, the answer is to just close the courthouse door, um, which is not generally a, a something that I'm, I'm supportive of. While, you know, look, full disclosure, I used to work for a, for a development company, right? And, and as their corporate counsel, I can understand kind of putting reasonable 
guardrails in there to make sure that you're not having fraudulent claims or anything like that, right? But we're talking about actual definitive claims. They should have an opportunity to be heard and, and addressed. And so you've got, and then on the other side of the, the coin, you've got folks who are coming to the legislature saying, wow, can you believe that, you know, and, and I don't know if you have a specific example, but the one that comes to mind for me is, oh, well, can you believe that, you know, my neighbor's home was taken by the HOA or taken by the CEO, you know, the condo association because he failed to pay his dues or whatever. And that's a knee jerk reaction that the legislature has. Okay, fine. Then we're going to prohibit that, right? Or we're going to put additional protections on that. Meanwhile, to your point, the HOA or the condo associations left holding the bag, right? And kind of stuck somewhere in the middle. So sometimes it's just a case of the legislature not being intellectually consistent. You know, it's funny, but this gets us back almost full circle to who's reaching out to their legislators. You know, my experience has been, Dan, that the, the vast majority of people are not contacting their legislators. But you do have people who who maybe have a problematic relationship with the board. And this is not to say that boards are always right. There are some bad boards out there. But yes, you can, you have to pay your assessments if you buy in an association. And I know mm -hmm. some people have complained to legislators, by the way, in the past, we've actually had legislators who were delinquent in the payment of their own condo assessments. And then they decided, you know, toe ball, there ought to be a law, but this yeah. is how associations fund their services is through yeah. assessments. So to that point, you know, I think sometimes our legislators are getting a one-sided, a lopsided perspective on association lifestyle. I remember when I used mm -hmm. to go up there and I would speak in front of committee, one of the questions I would ask is how many of you live in a condo or HOA? How many of you have served at the board? Very few hands went up. If you don't live in that, and you do, so you know, but so you kind of know how it operates. And you mm -hmm. also know that there's a lot of apathy. And a lot of times people don't read the documents and people, you know, I was at a meeting and the real estate agent who happened to be also living in the community said, well, the association can't foreclose on my home. It's homestead. It was incorrect information. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of misinformation out there. Yeah, I think I have never taken well to the argument, the anti-HOA argument, right? Well, I, my HOA is out of control and they need to be disbanded. I can't believe we even have HOAs. Listen, at the end of the day, you bought that home. You bought that home knowing that it was an HOA, or you bought that home and the community around you decided to form an HOA, which, you know, there's a process that you know better than me to do that, right? So you've had every opportunity to weigh in, you've had every opportunity to, you know, do all of those things. But I don't, not to say that their argument falls on deaf ears, but you made that decision, right? Almost to the kind of the old school buyer beware, right? Oh, well, I didn't realize that in my documents. Well, then you should have read your documents, right? Or had your attorney read your documents. And I don't um, see these cities taking back these, you know, let's say that we would abolish an HOA, a homeowners association. Some of them are extinguished due to the marketable record title act, but right. I don't see who's going to provide these services. Code enforcement, the cities okay. don't want to take for the most part them back. They encourage these kind of associations because it does take a lot of heat off of them in terms yeah. of having to use resources. I do think it is going back though, real quick to that to that other point. I, I do think it is a little bit of a you do have to look at it from both sides. I can look at it having been on both sides. I can look at it from both perspectives. And, and here's what I mean by that: you do have a situation where the legislature, the condo condo statutes. I think you'll agree with me are a little bit tighter. They're a little bit there's a there's a process in place. There's the condo ombudsman's office. There is some avenue where you can have some recourse if you have an issue with your condo association. You know, and like I know, like, like in anything else, there are some bad actors, less than good actors, whatever the case may be, for whatever reason. And those are a lot of the complaints I get, right? They're not, hey, I hate my HOA and I want to abolish my HOA. It's, hey, I have an issue with the board or, hey, I don't think that the election that they just did was a legitimate election or I have concerns over the spending or where the money's going or whatever, right? Those are all legitimate concerns. And I do think by and large, the legislature, and I'd be interested to get your perspective on this, over the, you know, whatever, past 10, 20 years, I think the legislature has kind of gone more hands off and said, hey, we're just going to kind of let HOAs be their own kind of fiefdoms. And I think the I don't know, what's the expression? The chickens are coming home to roost. I, I can't did. tell you. <laughs> that's true. Right? I think that's right. <laughs> or the, I don't know. Rooster, roosters, I don't know. Roosters, roosters coming. Uh, no, chickens coming somebody's, home to roost. <laughs> somebody's coming home to roost, right? <laughs> um, but you've got, I'm getting a lot, particularly in Coral Springs, of issues where, you know, DBPR, the Department of Business and Professional Regulation, who has some oversight on HOAs, but is very minimal, as you know, you know, they came in and they looked and they said, well, yeah, that election was illegitimate, but you were one day past the deadline that you had to notify us. So we can't throw out the election. And now they're going to have to deal with that board that was elected by fraud. Right. And I get that that's a one-off, 
But I do think there needs to be a give and take. And I think for several years now, we've just kind of said, hey, HOAs, go do your own thing. You're going to have minimal oversight. And the only recourse that any resident in HOA is going to have is private lawsuit. And I don't think that's the answer either. So I, I do think as much well, as the I division don't does, open, Well, I think the division does now have some oversight when it comes to elections, when it comes to financial operations. It could, But again, we've gone back and forth, Dan, over the years as to whether or not right. HOA should be folded into the division's oversight. I do think there's a lot that the legislature has passed over the years. Term limits, for example, they've made it easier to recall bad board members. You've got the election monitoring that people could take advantage of. So there are resources out there. I think we can always do better. I sure. think there are, as you said, there are legitimate complaints that people have about their associations. The advice I give is attend your board meetings. Okay. Yeah. Now, if they're not having board meetings, that's a problem. Reach out yep. to an attorney and see if you can assert your rights that way. But if they are having board meetings, attend them, run for the board. I don't know. I used to have a blog way back when, Dan, and I got, the only time I ever got hate mail is when I said that serving on the board should be like jury service. Everybody should get a number and you just don't even have, it. people went crazy. But I said right. that way, at least everybody gets to serve on the board. You don't have to deal with the elections. It's just your number's up and you're on. Yeah. Look, we're always going to have these issues because associations are made up of what? People. Yeah. So you've got the personalities. And by the way, sometimes it's, I've got some boards that are great and they are dealing with particular owners who it is their daily mission to just lob grenades at the board, at the manager, at the vendors coming into the community. So we've got problems both way. I think yeah. the more we can rely on, on mediation, perhaps an alternative dispute resolution, I think that's going to be, you know, we, we should be investing more in that. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think I think my point is just from my perspective, and and certainly you know you and I and, and others can can continue to have more conversations, and I'd, I'd welcome that opportunity given how frequent this has now become. But you know I I'm kind of heartbroken. In certain cases, you have a, a little old lady who's having an issue with her HOA or or a, a family that's having an issue with their HOA, and and my only response is hey you know, I'm sorry if it's not about the election or about, you know, those limited things that DBPR regulates, you've got to go hire your own attorney, right? Which, as I'm sure you know, a lot of folks don't have that kind of money to go do either. And so they're just kind of stuck in that catch-22 of, okay, well, what do we do? And to your point, you know, yeah, they can run for the board or or something. But I think we've got to, we've got to at some point have to have a, a serious conversation about what the right balance is, because I think we're a little lopsided, at least from my perspective. Well, as attorneys, we have pro bono requirements, and I know I've fulfilled some of my pro bono requirements representing owners and hopefully people listening. If there's more attorneys out there willing to take on some of these egregious cases on a pro bono basis, that would be helpful. Yeah. So, yeah. Dan, you mentioned earlier about a potential funding programs, grants or loans that the state may be able to offer these older communities with people on fixed incomes who now need take up deferred maintenance, fully fund mm -hmm. reserves. I know you're in favor of that. What about your colleagues in the legislature? Is there any talk of that? Yeah, so it's it's come up a little bit. And and, and look, just to be clear to kind of the, the point I was making earlier, I'm only OK with it in, in, a, in a very limited kind of narrow scope and i don't know exactly what that looks like i don't know if you have to have a certain percentage of of your of your owners on a fixed income or or something right there's got to be i think there's got to be some sort of test there so that you don't have you know a condo that you know a condo association taking advantage of of state taxpayer dollars to fund these things that should have been accounted for right kind of going back to my original my my original point of you know look if you if you had enough money to increase your your assessment so you you could make the place look pretty you you shouldn't be able to to raise that assessment or change the you know change the funding around to fund the things that matter in terms of keeping the building standing right who cares if it looks pretty if it falls down and so i think in that limited instance i think i can probably get there i think most of my colleagues would probably get there in something limited and, and targeted and specifically going to those who are absolutely in need and have no other alternative, but there's gonna have to be, I think, some, some sort of test there. And we saw the SAFER Act was passed recently. My reading of it, Dan, is it's going to have limited applicability to many of our associations. I think the, the threshold was $25,000 in income for an owner. So I don't know if we're, I guess we'll wait and see if there's going to yeah. be any any federal legislation that might help. I mean, the SAFER Act is definitely a, a start, but 
again, I think it's going to have limited application. I just want to touch on one other thing. You also mentioned we talked about affordable housing, right? Is that something, and I had a prior guest on, Marisa Delenge, a realtor, and she was recently talking about this. We've got all these, you know, Fortune 500 companies coming to Florida. We've got, I think, Michelin-starred restaurants coming to Florida. Well, who works in those? We've got, you know, busboys and and chefs and dishwashers. Where are these people going to live? Is affordable housing on the radar for our legislature? It is. It is. And I will tell you, it, it should have been a long time ago, right? I mean, you're talking about a legislature that for, I don't know, 10 years raided the Sadowski Trust Fund, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and used those dollars and other things and didn't put that money, didn't make sure that that money went to what it was supposed to go to in terms of affordable housing. I also think that there's a difference between, you know, look, when, when somebody says affordable housing today versus affordable housing 10 years ago, I think there was a, a negative connotation and there shouldn't have been. There shouldn't have been a negative connotation 10 years ago when you said affordable housing. I think people automatically thought, well, Section 8 or, or some other, you know, some other level of affordable housing. And that's really not right. One, it wasn't right then. It's not right now. But two, you know, you're not just talking about the busboys and the and the cooks and the, and the hospitality workers. You're talking about everybody struggling to find affordable of, and, and not even if, call it attainable, call it, call it housing, right? Housing period. What we've seen in the market in Florida, as I'm sure your, your last guest mentioned, is astronomical property values, astronomical fights, bidding wars, six people, seven people bidding for a single property that's been on the market for two days that somebody from New York or somewhere else is coming down and they're offering 60, 70, $80,000 cash over ask. Like that's nuts. That's not sustainable. And you're exacerbating an issue that's already been prevalent in South Florida, right? I mean, what we, we've been ranked, what, the most expensive place to live now? I think Miami-Dade um, for, for rent. Miami-Dade, yeah. right? Yeah. And well, and it's, and it's rental, it's, it's purchase. I mean, Heck, I just, I'm just going through this now. I'm looking to buy a place, uh, another place in the next year, and it's behind because of construction delays and stuff like that. So I had to rent again for the next couple of years, and I had to really search, and everything is skyrocketing in, in price. And the number of emails, Donna, that I've gotten in just the last three or four months that are heartbreaking from residents in my community who said, Dan, I've lived in Coral Springs or I've lived in Tamarack my entire life. I've lived here for 20 years. I've raised my kids here, whatever the case may be but my landlords raised my rent by 200% and I can't afford it, right? Or I can't find a place to live. My lease has ended. They didn't renew my lease and I can't find anywhere that I can afford. So I have to move out of Coral Springs or I have to move out of South Florida or heck, I have to move out of Florida, right? So I don't even look at it as an affordable housing crisis. I look at it as a housing crisis. We don't have enough stock to house the people we have here now. And you've got all those people coming in that are, you know, washed with cash and that's good for them, but it's not sustainable. And also for the people who are paying 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars cash, you know, over ask, you're never going to see that money again, right? I mean, I, I'm no real estate expert here, but I mean, it doesn't take a genius to see we're going to eventually cool off or, you know, decline. I don't know that you're going to get that money back. Do you think one option, Dan, might be to require developers, and I know this is already happening, to set aside a certain amount of units or homes in the developments they're creating and make them affordable? I think, look, I, I think there are certain, certain counties and certain municipalities have taken to doing that as part of their affordable housing requirement. I think a lot of the time they allow just a buyout. I think they're getting a little more strict on the buyout, right? Because, hey, developer, you can either use, you know, 10 of your units for affordable housing and, you know, cap the price or you, you know, you pay us 10000 per unit into a fund, right? And the problem is, where is that $10,000 per unit going? Um, is it actually going somewhere else to address affordable housing? Um, and, and by and large, and in, in, in a lot of times, in a lot of cases, especially when money's tight, I don't think it is, right? Kind of like the legislature sweeping Sadowski. If you have all these all these dollars, but they're not being used for what they were intended for, you're not solving any problem anyway. But we are so, Donna, we are so far behind when it comes to stuff like that. I don't think requiring a developer to build in, and hold five units, 10 units, 12 units, 20 units is really it's a, drop in the bucket. This, it's a drop in the bucket, right? You know, so I, I think we have to have a longer, more comprehensive look at what's been going on, what's causing the continued increase in property values and everything. And look, for a lot of folks, that's really good. Unless you're, you know, priced out of your rental unit or you can't find a place to live or you keep losing, you know, you have a first time home buyers, but you don't have sixty, seventy thousand dollars cash to throw at your offer, right? I know of one resident, a friend of mine who had lost a, a battle on I don't know, it was like six or seven houses before they finally got one, they were able to get a jump on 
and push through with the sale, right? These are folks that have lived in Coral Springs literally their entire lives and couldn't find a place because they kept losing in that bidding war. It's so interesting that people sometimes don't see the forest through the trees because you could, you know, buy that mega mansion of your dreams. But if you're sitting in a city where the strip malls have one empty shop after another because they don't have anybody that's working in them. I mean, that yeah. the health of the community overall is what I would think a prospective purchaser would also want to look into. Yeah, I would agree with that. So we've been talking about older coastal communities and um, we haven't yet touched on climate change. You know, a lot of the task forces that were convened in the aftermath of Surfside discussed how climate change and sea level rise could have played important factors in that tragedy. Is this something, you know, that the state is talking about? What can and should the state of Florida be doing right now with regard to climate change and sea level rise? Well, first and foremost, I, I think we need to do more, right? I think it's probably, if not the, the biggest issue facing Florida long term, certainly one of the biggest, right? And again, ties into the affordable housing issue and, and everything else, because you can't just plop down more buildings and do it the same way that we've always been doing it. I think the thing that I find interesting, and, and, and I'm cautiously optimistic because of it, is you finally have, and, and this is going to sound like a jab, and maybe it is a little bit, but you finally have leaders in Tallahassee on the other side of the aisle who are willing to admit that climate change is real, right? And that that sea level rise is real, and which is amazing to me that it took this long. Somebody should have taken them to Miami Beach, you know, two, three years ago or to Fort Lauderdale after a King Tide. And- and let them see it for themselves. Field trip. And, and right, right. And I and I and I laugh, but it's really, you know, it's it's kind of sad that it took us that long to realize, hey, this is legitimate and it's not junk science and it's impacting people not not five years from now, 10 years from now, but right now. Right. And so cities like, you know, Miami Beach and a couple others who are really starting to invest in different ways to to work on that issue need to be encouraged to continue to do so. Maybe you need some additional funding, maybe you need some additional assistance, as do some other cities that maybe are kind of late for the game. But ultimately, we just can't continue to do what we've always done and expect it to just solve itself. Right. And to just say, okay, well, sea level rise is what it is, but, you know, we're just going to we're just going to go for it. We're just going to pop up another high rise. And I understand, right? It, it goes back to the affordable housing thing. We want to be able to have that new unit, you know, those new units come online and, and get people living in them and everything else. But if you're not addressing climate change and sea level rise, you're in the long run, just screwing that property over. Right. And I guess um, a lot of this is local too, Dan, in terms of what the counties are willing to accept in terms of density yeah. and proximity to the coastline. That's right. A lot of it is. And, 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 and look, as it, as it should be, but from a state perspective, we should be monitoring all of that. We should be looking at all of that and saying, hey, what Miami Beach is doing is really creative. Why haven't other areas of the state picked up on that? And I, and I know, I, I do know, because I've, I've looked into running some legislation along these lines, there are some grants available, particularly for smaller cities who want to try something creative, who want to try something different to fix the, you know, the issue in their, in their area, that the state will actually help them fund and I think you need more of that. I think you need, you know, the, the intellectual wheels need to turn and we need to come up with some solution here. And look, one solution that works for Miami Beach may not work for another coastal city. So we got it. That's why you've got to have everybody in that kind of competitive. Hey, let's all find an answer. But let's have the state also kind of pitch in and, and do our part. I mentioned in the introduction, Dan, that you're on all these committees and subcommittees. And I know I know you can. I know you're a smart guy very accomplished, but you can't be a subject matter expert on everything. So who do you rely on when you're getting, when these bills are, you know, being brought up in the committees in which you sit? So who do you talk to? So, you know, look, I I look to, and I think a lot of my colleagues look to policy matter experts. And so, you know, that may be, that may be a lobbyist that represents an interest. But what I always look for from, from a lobbyist that comes to see me is, okay, I want to hear your argument, why you think you're right or your client's right. But then I want to see, I want to hear your explanation of the other side. Right. Because one, maybe I don't get to meet with the other side or whatever, but I also want to hear both sides of the argument. And I want you to be intellectually honest when you when you tell me that. Or it's community leaders, it's uh, local elected officials, it's condo board members and and presidents and HOA board members and presidents. It's it's Donna. Um, You know, it's it's the policy matter expert. And I'll be honest, a lot of times it's it's our own membership. Right. So if I have uh, an issue that I don't really understand in the medical space, for example, I may go see, you know, Ralph Masulo, who's been a medical doctor for 20 years and may go to him. Now, that's a little bit risky, right? Because if he feels a certain way about a certain policy, you know, maybe he's going to push me in that direction. But I know Ralph, he's a good guy. He wouldn't do that. Right. But that's kind of the risk you run is you want to kind of get that unbiased 
hey, give me both sides so that I understand the issue and can get to the right decision. That's a lot of what we look to. And that's why it's important that your board members and your communities have relationships with their elected officials. You should have the contact information for your elected official. You should invite them to your condo association meeting. You should invite them to their HOA meeting to come and speak, give a 15 minute update, whatever. Build a relationship with that person so you're the person that they think of when there's a condo issue or an HOA issue. Hey, we're, we're talking about this bill in Tallahassee. What do you think about it? What's it gonna mean for you? Is it good? Is it bad? Is there an amendment that you would, you know, you would propose? So that's that's I think the best way that the process works is is to is to cast a wide net and try to cut, touch as many policy matter experts as you can. That was always my advice, Dan. And and do it over the summer. That's right. <laughs> Don't try to do it during session. That's not the time to start creating the that's relationship. Right. But again, listen, your legislator is going to reach out to a bunch of different people. You want to create consensus. You want to know, okay, this is what you're saying, but what are the opponents of this proposal going to say? Right. So I think it's really important advice. If I'm remembering correctly, each legislator gets six bill slots. Is that still the case? So we bumped it, the, the speaker actually bumped it up to seven. So we're, we're capped at seven. The Senate is as many as they'd like. So how do you decide on your bill slots? What, how do you decide what bills you want to sponsor? So it really depends. Um, you know, a lot of what I focus on, and, and, and I don't want to say every member has a kind of silo that they fall into or focus on, but they, they do generally find an area of interest that they like to work on. And so for me, like I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, for me, that's that's you know preventing something like the tragedy of my alma mater, uh, Stoneman Douglas, from happening again. So it's it's school safety, it's reasonable firearm reform, it's it's mental health, it's it's anything in that whole gamut of of trying to prevent that from happening again. It's uh, swim safety for children. It's those are just a couple of the bills we've we've worked on in the last couple of years. Environmental sustainability. So it just kind of finding. For me, it's it's what's out there, what's what's important to me, what's important to my community, maybe what's a glaring issue, right? Right now, so maybe I file something on affordable housing, or maybe I file something on HOA reform, right? If I want to, <laughs> if I want to open that 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 box, so it, it really varies. I also like Ari, and this is actually how Ari and I met originally. I run a high school bill contest, and so every year uh, we open it up to all of Broward County high schools. And we run a bill contest and students can submit a bill idea uh, and then we review it and submit it. And last year, not last year, two years ago, we were able to get that student bill idea across the finish line. It puts a crisis intervention hotline number on the back of every student identification card in the state of Florida. So hoping that, you know, maybe just maybe if somebody is going through a mental health crisis, they see that number and, and rather than taking and, some, and some a drastic student, step, a student, a student came up with that idea. Idea. Wow, that's, that's amazing. That's correct. Yep. So really and you're going to continue with that program, Dan? Absolutely. Yep. We'll run that every year. So I have to ask you, you've sponsored House Bill 181, which is known as Jamie's Law, named after Jamie Gutenberg, who was killed at Marjorie Stoneham Douglas. My understanding, the purpose of that bill is to require background checks on the sale or transfer of ammunition. That right. bill has not passed. You've tried three years in a row. Right. As we're sitting here... Today, 4th of July shooting just happened in Highland Park, which I'm from Chicago. Had yeah. A lot of people in Highland Park. We're a few weeks out from the Uvalde, Texas shooting. Do you ever lose hope on this issue? Because I know it's a really personal issue yeah. for you. Uh, I know you're not going to give up, but do you ever yeah. just feel hopeless about this? So you can't, right? You can't. You really can't. You can't feel hopeless because I. you have to remember, I'll give you an example, right? I mean, Aaron Feiss, who was one of the other victims from, from Douglas, I've known since I was 15 years old, right? Coach Feiss used to walk through the halls, used to joke with us, was a great guy, great family, who I had gotten to know over the years and then obviously know them in a different way now. So you can't give up hope. Because if those folks haven't given up hope, you you know, certainly I, I can't and, and others shouldn't. But it is, to your point, it's it's hard. Right. It's hard because every single time one of these things happens, whether it's Texas, whether it's, you know, Douglas, whether it's Buffalo, New York or any other, you know, we keep saying never again, never again, never again. And then it happens again. And my hope is that every single time one of these things happens, we get a little bit more momentum to say, hey, this really is enough and we need to take a step in this direction or that direction. I'll be honest, I'm headed to the bill signing in Washington, D.C. on Monday for the gun bill that just passed at the federal level. I'll be honest, I didn't think they were going to be able to make it work. Now, is it perfect? No. Does it address all of the issues? No. Does it go far enough? No. In my opinion, it doesn't. But is it a step in the right direction? Is it something that we're actually tangibly able to hold on to rather than just resorting to some you know, NRA talking points or whatever? Yeah, that's a big step, right? That's a big deal. 
And so, no, I, I, I try not to lose hope, although in Tallahassee, given the numbers, it is difficult, you know, but I look, you know, I've, I've been able to build a relationship with Fred Guttenberg and with a lot of the victims, uh, victim families from Douglas and work with them on bills that we have passed. Uh, Alyssa's Law, putting a panic alarm in every school in the state of Florida and getting some funding for that. Parents Need to Know Act, making sure that schools are notifying parents whenever there's an issue or an incident on campus, right, within a reasonable period of time, because that's part of what didn't happen in Douglas. You know, but things like Jamie's Law, I view that as, as low-hanging fruit, right? I'm, I'm a concealed carry permit holder. I support the Second Amendment. I got no problem with guns. I'm not coming for your guns. I don't view a 90-second background check as an infringement on my rights. And I don't think, by and large, the vast majority of responsible gun owners view it as an infringement on their Second Amendment right. And your bill was designed to do a background check on ammunition, which I think is really clever, right? Yeah. You can't use the AR-15 without the, the clip. Correct. But the opposing view, again, on that was what? No? No background check on, on ammunition? No, no, no background check. It's, it, this is just another infringement on our Second Amendment right. But Donna, here, let me, let me be very clear on, on Jamie's law, right? So in Florida today, there is a class of prohibited purchasers. These are convicted felons. These are mentally unstable individuals deemed mentally unstable by a court, right? These are individuals that are not permitted to purchase firearm or ammunition today. The difference is that there's no actual preventative measure. There's no actual check when it comes to ammunition. So play this out, right? Because the other side loves the argument, well, the, you know, the bad guy doesn't follow the law. Okay, so play this out. Convicted felon goes and finds a gun, steals a gun, buys it from a private seller, I don't care, whatever, gets their hands on a firearm. They are then able to go to any place that sells ammunition in the state of Florida and buy as much as they want, and no one would know any different. It's baffling to me that something as simple as a 90-second background check, which is what 90%, excuse me, 30-second background check, which is what 90% of the background checks in Florida take, is deemed an infringement on somebody's Second Amendment right. But that's what I'm talking, the right hand, the left hand, knowing what each is doing. If the state has passed a law saying these folks should not have the firearms, then you would think the corollary to that is these folks should not also have the ammunition. That's right. And, okay, well, and, well, and, and Donna, Donna, I'm not going to try to figure it out, Dan. I'm I, not get it. <laughs> I get it. I boil it down to when a 20 something year old walks into a bar, they have to show an ID before they can buy a beer. Right. That's that's no different here. Somebody walks in and they want to buy I don't even care. You want to buy, I don't know why you need it, but you want to buy 500 rounds of ammunition because you want to take it to the gun range. That's fine. But pass a 30 second background check that says, Hey, I'm allowed to buy this, you know, 500 rounds of ammunition. I'm hoping that next year you're going to, I assume, sponsor this bill again. We will. We will. Right. Yeah. I'm hoping you're going to get it passed because it just makes sense in light of the legislation that's already on the books. Yeah, I appreciate it. I know another concern of yours, Dan, is that our national guard in Florida is undermanned. I think it's currently comprised of approximately 12,000 soldiers and airmen. So that's right. I read this out, by the way, I read this on your little glossy handout that came to my home and I went, oh, <laughs> that's interesting. And then I said, what? I'm thinking to myself, what is the job of Florida's National Guard? So I'm going to ask you, what's the job and what's your, what's your <laughs> suggestion for a solution? Sure. Well, first and foremost, I'm glad to know that you got our newsletter. So I appreciate I that. And thank you. And thank you for reading it, because I know that <laughs> this way it didn't go right into the trash. So, you know, look, Florida's National Guard, as, as folks may know, they're, you know, the National Guard is our kind of citizen soldier, right? These are supposed to be our, our weekend warriors, if you will, right? They're not full-time military personnel. They actually fall under the purview of the governor of the state of Florida, but they can be federally activated to, to deploy to, to foreign countries in service to the United States military under the purview of the president. And so they kind of pull, in that respect, they kind of pull double duty, right? So they can be activated for things like COVID. They can be activated for things like hurricanes and civil unrest and other things that may go on, any, any natural disasters in the state of Florida, but then can also be federally deployed. We actually have Florida guardsmen and women in, what is it, five of the six combatant commands. So five of the six military geographic regions of the world right now, right now today. And so, and these are folks that have families back home here in Florida and have full-time jobs and, and they just signed up to, to serve their community and their nation. And the, the issue you have is, as we talked about earlier, Florida is a big state, right? We're the, what, the third largest state now with 22, almost 23 million people. And yet you've got 12,000 guardsmen. Now, by contrast, I forget the exact number. I want to say the state of Alabama that's got, I think, 5 million has 12,000 guardsmen right? It's not comparable. And with the amount of shoreline that we have and our propensity for natural disasters with hurricanes and stuff like that, 12,000 is really wholly inadequate. These folks have put in more operational hours in the last 18 months than they have in the last 20 years. 
So these same men and women are cycling through again and again and again, being deployed for COVID, being deployed to a neighboring country to Ukraine or whatever the case may be. We're asking a lot of these folks and they're starting to get burnt out. They're starting to not re-up. They're starting to choose, you know, folks are starting to choose to not go into the National Guard. They'd rather go be in the reserve where there's less of a time commitment, which you almost can't blame them. So the bill that we were able to pass this legislative session sends a what's called a memorial to Congress saying, hey, this is a really big issue and Congress needs to act because only Congress can increase the number of troops that we have. But trying to just put as much pressure as we can on Congress and the Department of Defense to address this because 12,000 is inadequate and it's putting our state and candidly our nation at risk. So what would be the different role between Florida's National Guard and Governor DeSantis's reactivated Florida State Guard, Dan? Yeah. So the State Guard and, you know, look, and there was a little bit of controversy around it when he when he first announced it. You know, this is going to be DeSantis's own army and stuff like that. My understanding, and I've talked to the adjutant general about it, the State Guard is really an, an, an auxiliary, if you will. Right. These are folks that, from my understanding, are not going to be armed. They're not going to have their own, you know, military arms and, and tanks and all that other stuff. They're meant to be complementary. They're meant to, you know, help with traffic and help with the ancillary things around a National Guard deployment. So they're not taking the place of the Guard. They're not doing anything like that. And by the way, I, I want I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but it's, it's something like 200 to 300 members of the State Guard. We need something more like 15 to 20,000 additional National Guard. So that's not the solution to the undermanning of the, okay, okay. But they would be helping also with COVID if we had another issue with that or civil unrest, although they're not armed, correct? Correct. That's my understanding is they are not going to be armed, but they will do, like I said, right? So if you have a, a, a COVID, the, the example I give is when you go to do one of those COVID test sites we used to have, right? You had National Guardsmen there controlling traffic and stuff like that. There's probably a better service for them to be performing. Right. And so let somebody that wants to come in and volunteer to do that, you know, do the traffic that kind of I don't want to undercut it. It's the, the menial things that the guardsmen and guardswomen don't need to be doing. Gotcha. So I have to and by the way, you've been so generous with your time. I'm going to let you go. I just have one last question. Sure. What are your future political aspirations? Governor, <laughs> president, no, what, Tom, come on. I, I appreciate that very much. You know, <laughs> look, I, I have had the honor to serve my hometown, my community now for 10 years. This November will be 10 years. Uh, And like I mentioned in the beginning, I have the receding hairline to prove it. I enjoy service. I enjoy having a seat at the table and being able to be a voice, oftentimes for the voiceless, right? And I'd like to continue in that that realm. And, And what shape that may take, I don't know. But I think you know me well enough to know I don't do it for the title. I don't do it. I certainly don't do it for the money right? I do it to try and help people. And so as cheesy as that sounds, I enjoy what I do. And I'm running for re-election in November. So if you live in my district, I'd appreciate your support. I don't know if you I'm allowed have, to say you, that or not. You <laughs> you have my support and I want to see you keep going up. I, you know, I I, you that. started very young, so you've got a long road ahead of you. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Don. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to follow and rate us on your favorite podcast platform or visit TakeItToTheBoard.com for more ways to connect.